or your uh, personal profile? Um, I think it's my personal profile. This is fancy stuff. This is not. You don't need all this stuff to hang out. All right. We're just trying. I just want to be able to. Do this. I'm seeing. Um, I'm seeing uh, the uh, the hangout player in your own uh, personal page uh, profile. Yeah, I can't link to it. Oh, here we go. All right, now I can. All right. So. You should have a a, a button for embedding the the HTML yep, code around the top of the. Of the toolbar, the Hangout toolbar. All right, so you, we're going to mute for a second. Okay, right. we're going to get started uh -huh. uh, with with our hangout here, and um, we have people joining. Somebody just joined, so we've got uh, Paulo with us and David. How are you, David? Where and, and uh, Paulo, where are you from? I'm from uh, Milan in Italy. Oh, okay. Well, welcome, welcome. And David, where where are you checking in from? Uh, I'm from New Jersey. Okay. All right. Well, we're um, good. We're going to have a, a our first Google Plus Hangout with uh, Samantha Cristoforetti, and um, Samantha's been on Google Plus for a while. How long have you been on, been on Google Plus? Um, I checked. Pretty much from the start, I got an invitation when it was still limited, so I thought it was a pretty exciting platform to be on, and uh, I haven't been able yet to explore this uh, Hangout. Uh, feature. Um, I kind of had to break the ice and I think it's really an exciting tool to be able to talk to people all over the world and share what's going on in, in training and in preparing for a, um, a space flight. And so um, I'm, I'm really happy that you know I bumped into you lately and we talked about this and you being the um, absolute and recognized the resident expert here yeah, at JSC for that. Google Plus. Um, it, it's really cool that you gave me a chance to try it out. With you. <laughs> so you have over a half a million followers on Google Plus, right? And but you haven't had a, a hangout yet. So exactly. this is this is our first attempt to do a hangout. So bear with us as we as we muddle through this, uh, and uh, I'm sure we'll have some more people join. Uh, but I, I think uh, probably a good thing to do would be to, to talk about um, your training. You're getting ready for uh, a mission, a six-month mission to the International Space Station. And, uh, you know, obviously there's a lot of training involved with that. And, uh, you know, uh, maybe talk a little bit about what you expect on the mission and, and um, you know, what your hopes are and what your personal objectives are and goals. And All right. Um. It, it, it's a long process. I mean, you get assigned to a mission, and then your your life sort of changes completely. In a way, I like to say you 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 give the keys of your life to somebody else, and and somebody else manages that life for you. Uh, so in a way, you you lose control of your life, but it becomes 
way more interesting and exciting um, because throughout this training process there is so much you have to learn and so many challenges you have to overcome and and the most exciting thing is that you meet so many different people who are all experts in their field and they're trying to convey you their knowledge and transmit you uh, what they know um, and help you build up the skills you need for space flight and they're all incredibly passionate about it and incredibly talented and and excited and it's great just to interact with them on a daily basis um, and you know we, we can <coughs> to the details of the training if, if well, a lot of people don't really understand that we're, we're training all around the world. And so, how you know, out of 365 days a year, how many how many days do we go on the road? <laughs> I don't know, many, many. Um, I, I think it's, uh, it's a big deal if I can be like three or four weeks in a row without being on an airplane or without spending a full day um, in airports or in airplanes. Um, which is fine. I mean, I, I have to say I have come to appreciate those times as like buffer times. You know, you, you sit in the airplane for a transatlantic flight and you're like disconnected from the internet. And, and, and I love the internet. I mean, I, I'm online all the time. But I like those little buffer times, um, you know, when for a few hours you can just, um, you know, refocus and think about something, something else, read a book. Um, and, and as you said, the, the training centers are all over the world, um, mainly, of course, here at the Johnson Space Center at NASA and at the um, uh, Gagarin Cosmonaut Training Center in Moscow. And then, of course, you, we do a significant part of the training also in, uh, in Europe, at the European Asteroid Center. And some training, especially for the robotic arm in uh, Canada. And then uh, I, we also have some training trips to Japan. Mm -hmm. I had one which I really enjoyed, and I'm looking forward to a couple more before my, my launch. Yeah, that's why they call it the International Space Station. Exactly, because all these training centers actually only reflect the um, composition of the hardware up there. Yeah. Um, we have contributions of uh, modules and equipment from all these partners. And of course, all the partners <coughs> participate in the daily operations of the space station. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, um, part of the training in Russia is uh, is on the Soyuz. So I want to um, pop this picture up here. There's a, here's a, a Soyuz launch. And so you're going to be on the pointy end of that rocket. Uh, when, when is your launch date? Uh, at the moment, it's December 1st, 2014. Although there might be some slight changes. Uh, launch dates, as you know, mm -hmm. are adjusted a little bit. But um, yeah, it's less than two years away. It, it seems far. It's not at all. Yeah, Actually, yeah. you know, I'm I'm always I'm already starting to feel the the pressure of getting everything done uh, before the launch. But um, and this this week there was the official announcement, uh, public announcement of my uh, crewmate Terry mm -hmm. Burtz. Oh yeah. Yeah, the NASA astronaut, um, also with the Air Force background. He's a, a test was a test pilot yeah. in the um, U.S. Air Force. And uh, we are looking forward in the next days to um, to have our uh, Russian commander announced. You know what's the coolest thing about Terry? He's a bug. <laughs> what do you mean? Yeah, he's a, he's a class of two thousand. <laughs> oh, gotcha. We're, we're, the, we're the bugs. <laughs> so, right. so, so we've got this launch up here. This picture of the launch, and it looks like the the rocket is white. Is it? What, what do you think about that? You, you know about that? Because the rocket is, is actually not white. The, the rocket is, is like an olive green. Seriously? Yeah, but it's just all that the, all that white that you see there is 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 frost. Okay. It's from the cryogenic so I, I always think that's pretty cool. And you can see where the fire is. Um, just above it, you see that it's it's kind of green right there. That's as it's melting. Okay. And so shortly after liftoff, the whole all, you know all the ice melts. All, you know melts from the bottom up as it as it launches. So if you ever see a a launch picture of a Soyuz, you, you know where how far into the launch it is by how much how much has been uh, melting. Okay, so I'm going to unshare that. Actually, Should we see this. if uh, Paolo or Dave have any questions? Yeah. You got you guys have any questions? No, I can't hear Paolo. Can you hear him? Paolo, you're muted. Yeah, you have to unmute. Um. It's very interesting what you said about the science rocket color because uh, it's very apparent in the photographs in uh, videos before the launch but uh, uh, launch pictures uh, do show a white or brighter uh, color so I always wonder about it uh, too. That's very interesting. 
And uh, David, David, do you have any questions? How long does it take them to move the bucket from where it is onto the launch pad? You want to answer it? You probably know it better. It, you, you were there. <laughs> it's, it's a couple of hours. It's really a, an amazing um, thing to watch. So what happens is, um, you know, maybe a few miles away from the launch pad uh, is, a, is a facility where they assemble all the pieces. Uh, and this is out in Baikonur, the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. And uh, they, they take all the pieces, they put them together, and they, basically a train pulls the, the rocket laying on its side, uh, it pulls it out to the launch pad, and then when it gets to the launch pad, the, the, the carrier that, that it's on uh, has hydraulics that lift it up into the vertical, and, and then they get ready for launch. And it's you know, a matter of hours. It's, re it's really amazing to watch. And, and um, the pad that, that I launched from was the same pad that Yuri and Garen launched from 50 years earlier. So it's, uh, they've, been, they've been doing this for a while there. So <laughs> they've got it down, they've got it down to, a, to a science. Is there still the tradition of rolling out the rocket to the pad at uh, 7.30 a.m. in the morning, like uh, they did in the 1960s? You know, I had never heard that. I, that's about when they do it. I never realized that there was a significance to the time, though. Um, but I think that's about when they do it. So I don't, I don't know the answer. Yeah, and I haven't seen a rollout yet, but um, um, it's something that all crews get to see um, at least once. And not on your own launch, but uh, we have this system on the International Space Station where a crew will be ready for their launch actually six months ahead so that they can serve as backup for the crew who is launching six months before them. So you actually go to Baikonur the first time as part of your backup crew. And while the prime crew who is going to launch in the next days is actually locked up in quarantine, as the backup crew, you actually get to go out and watch a rollout. So it's a, it's a pretty exciting thing to watch. It's very beautiful. I mean, I've only seen pictures and videos so far, but it seems to be incredibly beautiful. Um, and actually, my backup uh, visit to Baikonur is going to be in spring. So I'm really happy that we'll have a nice warm weather for my, my opportunity to watch a rollout. And then when it's going to be our turn, we'll be locked up in quarantine and we won't care about the cold. <laughs> So, so what are your what are your expectations when you you know you have launched into space you spend a couple of days maybe uh, on orbit in the Soyuz and then you you dock to the space station and you open up the hatch what what do you what, what's your expectation? It's really hard to imagine. I mean, I I can only um, have my expectations based on what people have told me that I've had that experience and uh, um, you know from what I hear. You, you've spent two years in the, two days in the Soyuz, which is a very close, confined um, capsule and volume. And then you open that hatch, and all of a sudden you have this huge space station to you. Um, and I think it becomes, what I imagine is like moving from that feeling of uh, like real um, limited possibilities. You know, you're just in this small volume, and then you open up that hatch. There is this huge volume, this huge station with so much equipment and so much going on, and you have more that feeling of, Okay, you know, I arrived to a place where exactly. I can live and work in space. I mean, that's really exciting. Right. I mean, it's not just some kind of frontier. I mean, of course, it's the frontier, but it's already so well established that it's like, hey, I got to my to my living and working place for the next six months. I'm sort of familiar with it. I've, mm -hmm. I've trained. There's a lot to learn, but it, nothing is completely totally new uh, or unexpected, hopefully. And um, and it, you just have that feeling of you know so much has been accomplished already and I'm just, you know, joining in as part of uh, a chain of crews and a chain of events on the station. But by the way, we might not spend two right. days on the right. Soyuz. Right. Um, I think one of the upcoming launches might actually try that, uh, what the Russians call the Karotka Eschema, the, mm -hmm. the short scheme. Mm -hmm. So they will actually go straight from launch to docking uh, in, in a few hours. Mm -hmm. uh, so if that goes well, uh, then for sure it will be done an established practice by the time we launch. And we will actually not spend those two days right, on right. the service. Which in a way is nice, but in a way it's also a pity because I thought it would be actually nice to have those two, two days of buffer and two days of experiences that, that immediate content with space, like it's just you in a little can and yeah. outside space <laughs> right outside. But um, either way, it'd be great. Yes, it was. So it sounds like it sounds like you you really have uh, everything everything um, 
pretty much dialed in. You, got, you, you know what to expect, I, I think. So. We'll see. I mean, I'm sure there will be surprises, and, yeah. uh, uh, and I'm sure things will be much better than I, I can ever imagine them, like, you know, the view onto Earth. I think you can hardly imagine it. You know, you, you probably have to be there to really feel how it is. Mm -hmm. to, but it's a long road to get there. There's there's lots and lots of training, um, and and some of that is like survival training. So what what what, yeah. you, what what can you tell me about survival training? What can you tell everybody about survival? Training? Um, well, f first of all, it exists because uh, the Soyuz, of course, is not like the space shuttle, which would land in an expected place, you know, at a runaway, either the prime one or a backup runaway. Uh, the Soyuz is a capsule, so it, if something was to go wrong, then you could potentially land anywhere in the world. And so in Baikonur, the rescue, the search and rescue teams are awesome. I mean, they, they come, they, they usually have a visual on the Soyuz before it even touches down, and they're right there within probably minutes. Uh, but if you were to um, come down in some unexpected place because of a problem, then the crew is obviously expected to, is expected to survive at least a couple of days without um, external assistance. And so uh, it's really important to be familiar with what equipment you have on the Soyuz. Mm -hmm. And equipment means uh, the, the stuff that you can wear uh, to deal with the different uh, um, outside environment, and then of course the survival equipment that you have, which is pretty minimal. I mean, you have some food, you have some tools, uh, you have some water, um, and, and with that you are expected to be able to, you know, build a shelter, lit up a fire, and survive for a, a couple of days. And I've done like half of this whole deal. Uh, I've done my winter survival mm -hmm. uh, last year, and uh, I'm looking forward to my uh, water survival this summer. And, uh, and, and it's not only about, uh, you know, the mere skills of surviving, it's also about, you know, practicing your mental strength. You know, if mm -hmm. I have to be out two days, it, you know, it's not only about knowing how to do stuff, it's also about mastering up that mental toughness that allows mm -hmm. you to do that. And, uh, and so that's good practice too. Um, Was it fun? It was type two fun. <laughs> <laughs> type, what is type two fun? Type two fun is the fun that it's not quite so fun while you're doing it, but it's a lot of fun when you look back oh, to okay. it. Okay, <laughs> all right, yeah, I know, I, I, I've experienced that. So, you know, I just want to say, if, if uh, for everybody who's watching, um, if you're on Twitter and you want to send a question over Twitter, just put uh, Samantha or my. Um, um, Twitter name and, and we'll see that and we'll tr we'll try and get your get your um, get your question. So I'm um, uh, Astro underscore Ron and Astro Samantha without an underscore or That's Sam right. Astro, Astro Samantha. Astro, okay. Astro, yeah, without without an underscore. So we'll we'll take a look at, at that. So cool. And I think we do have some coming in. If you guys have any questions, Dave and Paolo, feel free to speak up. <laughs> Uh, when will be the first uh, uh, Soyuz mission to practice the um, the short uh, docking uh, in a few hours uh, instead of a couple of days? Um, I'm not really sure. It should be one of the upcoming ones. But you know, one of the things about being an astronaut in training is that you're kind of really fully immersed in that training thing. I mean, you're like very basic stuff. I mean, you're, you know, you're learning how to fix the toilet, you're learning how to um, deal with the water on board, you know, you, you, you're really inside this uh, very daily life and work on the station. And I don't really keep up that much with the uh, current events and uh, upcoming uh, changes. So I, you know, just by chatting with the cosmonauts and astronauts, I heard that it should be one of the upcoming flights, but um, you probably know more than I do if you follow the news uh, about exactly when it's going to happen. Not yet. Not yet. All right. <laughs> All right. So here, here's a question from uh, CN Oregon one uh, on Twitter. Uh -huh. And the question is, how important uh, do we feel the ISS is in terms of the future of, the, of manned spaceflight? Or as we like to say nowadays, human spaceflight. Right. Exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's hugely important, and uh, I don't know if uh, if most people realize that. Um, first of all, I think that if you want to make a step forward, you have to consolidate the step before. Uh, if it has to be a real progression, and it has to be steady, and it's just you know one one jump forward and then coming back. So 
Um, I, I do not completely agree with people that say, you know, oh, we went to the moon 40 years ago and then, you know, we haven't moved past low Earth orbit in the last 40 years. Yeah, that's a true statement. But um, it does not uh, give credit to the program for the fact that we have established very uh, steady, uh, you know, wide uh, and successful operations in low Earth orbit um, that give us a solid base to actually move forward. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you, you make a step, you establish, you consolidate, you're sure that you can do it, uh, you, you have proven operational concepts, you have proven technology, and then you're ready to make the next step. And, uh, you know, and obviously the ISS at this point is, is a well-established platform, and we are trying to use it more and more to prove concepts that will be uh, useful for operations. Mm -hmm. For example, um, I think yesterday I was sitting in, uh, in mission control, and uh, I realized, looking at the document and the messages, that the crew on board was um, performing modified procedures that implied that they would be able to do all that maintenance and troubleshooting without support from the ground. You know, typically we have a lot of support from the ground teams, but we are trying to move more and more towards what if the crew had to be completely autonomous? What if they didn't have support from the ground, at least not real time, if there was a big delay? So and it seems like a small thing, but you need to have all those things figured out if you want to go beyond the lower orbit and actually uh, stay there and, and be able to uh, successfully operate there. So um, I think ISS is hugely important right. for future exploration. Right. Plus all the research that we're doing on board the, the station. 99% oh, yeah. you know, of the research is going to help humans go further in the solar system. Oh, yeah. I mean, we're learning so much about the human body and how the human body uh, changes and reacts and adapts to microgravity and all the problems that arise from that and we cannot be surprised by those things once we go beyond lower orbit and stay in space longer. Okay. All right. Well, Lucy S. Uh, at Lucy in Towton uh, wants to know, wants to ask you, uh, as a female crew member, do you find it more difficult to work in this environment? No, not at all. Well, first of all, there might be a little bit of a I don't know, to me it seems like a misperception, like, uh, you know, this is such a male-dominated environment. I mean, especially here at NASA, there are lots of female astronauts and female crew members, so there is no way, you know, I could feel like something strange or unexceptional or something special. I mean, I, I would have to be totally unaware of the reality around me to feel that way. Um, and then, I mean, the, the female presence in this community is so established that I never really feel any difference. Um, it's really a topic that comes up more frequently in the interaction with the public because um, maybe we're more visible or people are more curious about us as females, but not in the real day-to-day -day professional environment. Yeah, and I, I think it's really important, and, and one of the things that you do, it's really important for, for young girls to realize that this is a career path that they can go down, because they, they see the, you know, people before them. I mean, this one, just like any other, really. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so Emmanuel Teichen uh, asks, uh, do we feel fear when riding the rockets? Um, and then, um, basically, you know, what do we feel about putting our lives in, the, in so many different hands? You know, so many people work on the rocket, so many people are involved with every aspect of safety, and you know, you're basically putting your life in, the, in those hands. So, um, that's a question that we get asked a lot. You're probably the best one to answer. You've been on there. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, you, you obviously realize that it, that it is a, an, something that that has risk associated with it. It's, it's you know, uh, going to be a long time probably that we where we can make flying into space safe. Um, it's it's not. It takes an awful lot of energy and a tremendous amount of energy to get to get uh, a spacecraft to the seventeen thousand five hundred miles an hour that it needs to to stay in orbit. So uh, there's a lot that that can go wrong in that. So you understand that you you know that 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 there's you know obviously possibilities. But I think. Um, you know, I don't want to speak for everybody, but everybody that I've talked to about this has the same answer, is that we do this because we believe in what we're doing. We believe that there's um, a great benefit to humanity uh, through space exploration. And it's yes, it's a risk, but it, it's worth the risk because of the, the tremendous payoff that, that we get on the other end. So. I agree. And, you know, putting your life in everybody else's hands 
you know, really, we all do it all the time. I mean, when you drive on the highway or on a regular street, you probably expect everybody else to abide by the same rules. You know, you expect somebody not to cross over to your lane coming in the opposite direction. I mean, we all trust other human beings to, to follow the rules and to do their, their part, uh, you know, to, to make sure that the, the life in the community is, is safe for everybody. Um, so w w when you become an astronaut or even, you know, we both were pilots in the Air Force before, and it's the same thing. I mean, you trust the, the mechanics and all the ground support crew to make sure that your airplane is safe. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to be able to control every little screw on the airplane and make sure that that's the case. You just trust them. Right. And you trust your wingman or your uh, lead to, to follow the rules and to know what they're expected to do, what they're expected to do. So... <clears throat> You know, you just change into a different professional environment and you just bring that that habit with you of trusting other human beings to do the job. Right. And especially when you, you travel around and you meet the people whose hands your life has been put in and you see, you know, the dedication and the, and, and the professionalism and the motivation in their eyes and you realize that, that everybody is, is really... Um, doing everything humanly possible to make it as safe as it possibly can be. So that's, that's always uh, very rewarding. So, um, should we do another Twitter question? Sure. All right. Um, I guess if you're tweeting question to me, I'm not really following. You better send to Astro Ron, Astro underscore Ron. I have trouble with my phone right now. All right. So, Ast Astro Samantha, uh, how will your mission contribute to public and youth excitement about space exploration in STEM? And that was from World Space Week. All right. Um, I think I haven't found a single person really, but especially, you know, kid, young person, boy, girl, who is not excited about space, who is indifferent about, you know, meeting an astronaut or anybody who is involved in the space business. So there's something very unique about this, this community and this program we, we all work for, which is it just automatically, inevitably creates excitement in every young person. So um, I think we need to exploit that. I think that I deeply believe that, you know, the difference in being successful in life, and I define success as, you know, being gratified, finding a path that's gratifying to you and being able to contribute. Uh, the key in being able to do that, in, you know, in building up the skills that allow you to do that is motivation. I mean, you need to be motivated, and that means you need to be excited about something. And so if you have something like space that inevitably is exciting for young people, uh, it's very easy to use it to 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 foster that excitement, that spark, to and to help them um, light it, light it, and keep it lit. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I I try and do my best to um, to communicate this excitement. And uh, um, as um, Bob Jacobs from NASA likes to say, you know, clean the window to make sure that people can see mm -hmm. through and, and watch what's going on and be excited about it. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. Um, I, I think I have a really good example of the power of the space program to inspire people to STEM education. When I, you know, I wanted to be an astronaut ever since the moon landing. I'm old enough to remember that. And, and throughout my whole life, that was what I was going to be. Whenever, when anybody asked me, you know, what I wanted to be when I grew up, I said an astronaut, and they were just kind of giggling with what do you really want to be. Um, but when I got to high school, I kind of lost that vision. And the reason why I lost the vision is because it was after Skylab, it was before the shuttle, and, and you know, from just some kid in New York, you know, we didn't have a space program. Um, and so, you know, I went off to college not knowing what I was, I was going to do, but when I was a sophomore, we had STS-1, the first space shuttle launch. The very next day, I went into my advisors and started asking how I could start taking science mm -hmm. and math courses, and I completely, on a dime, in the, over the course of one day, completely changed my academic direction because I really, you know, the light bulb came on. You know, we are back in business. This is, we are going to space. I want to be a part of this because, you know, I think this is a, you know, a really important thing for our future. So, um, and I think that's not an isolated story. I think there's a lot of stories like that about being inspired by um, the things that we do in the space program. And, uh, you know, it is really important to study those, those subjects. It is really, um, you know, our world is getting more and more technologically advanced and that requires more technical skills and those are the subjects you need to be able to, to make a difference in those fields. So. Plus, they're super fun and exciting. <laughs> they're super fun and exciting, exactly. <laughs> All right, so um, this is from uh, C.A. 
Volomey, and I, I, I apologize because I'm probably getting all the names wrong. Uh, but how much time do you have? Do you get to yourself for doing personal activities and outreach uh, during the rigorous ISS workday? How much do you expect? Let me. I know how much I got. Okay. How much do you think you're going to get? <laughs> so. I don't know. It's it's hard to say. Um, I think a lot comes down to how efficient you are, mm -hmm. um, and it probably that comes. It's going to get better and better being longer and longer on space in space. I think that maybe at the beginning, I might have to you know take care of my job even beyond normal work hours. You know, maybe looking ahead of tomorrow's timeline, see what I'm expected to do, um, making sure that I understand the procedure, making sure I know where the tools are. And so that's probably going to maybe take some time away of my free time at the beginning. But I hope, that's my hope, that I eventually become efficient at it and I'll be able to, you know, complete the timeline activities within the scheduled time, who knows even early, mm -hmm. and that will buy me time to you know, to do um, personal stuff and, and, you know, definitely as much outreach and communication as possible. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't think a lot of people realize that, you know, every time they see a tweet or a picture or, you know, anything that comes down from the astronauts, they, they do all that in their free time. And there's right. very, very little free time. It's a very, very busy place. We try and get every second out of every day to do research and science, and there's obviously maintenance that we have to do on the space station to keep it, keep it going. But we have a, a tremendous investment in the space station, and we want you know a, a return on that investment, and that requires a lot of really really hard work. Um, and you know a good example is Chris Hatfield right now. He's he's, he's awesome. on board and he's sending down you know just tremendous stuff. Um, but it's all coming out of his free time. Right. So there is some free time that's allocated, and you obviously you have to sleep, and that's important. Um, but there is you know some wind down time. Uh, maybe you know we can watch TV shows or, or movies um, or re or read books uh, and 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 that's great uh, but there's also you know you could also uh, in that time take pictures and, and write blogs and tell stories and, and share that experience with as many people yeah, as you and can. And you did a marvelous job when you were up there in fact you're the one who inspired me to be on Twitter <laughs> and to oh, be on Google Plus. So. <laughs> <laughs> well I mean it, it really is you know you one of the, the over um, overwhelming emotions I think that you have when you get to space is this feeling of, of gratitude for be, being given this experience right. and when you when you feel that you, you you can't help but also feel a responsibility to share it and and it's not you know so much of an altruistic thing it's whenever you, whenever you have this amazing experience it becomes even richer and deeper and more enjoyable when you get to share it with others and so um, you know every spare moment I had I was you know, my face plastered to a window with a camera in my hand and, and trying to capture capture not just the view but the experience and the emotion and everything else and so uh, I'm sure you, I'm sure you're gonna feel that that same thing so all right so how about you guys Paulo you got a question David I'd like to ask uh, uh, Ron uh, whether uh, he can tell us about uh, his uh, first very few uh, view outside, out of the uh, window of a spacecraft in space, and to ask Samantha uh, whether she ever thinks about her first uh, view outside the window. Yeah, so um, the first view looking at the Earth is, is breathtaking. It's, it's absolutely breathtaking because it, um, I don't think anything can really prepare you for it because, I mean, you see the pictures, uh, you know, we have great cameras now, we can take videos. But just the emotion of you know waiting your whole life to do something, and now you're you're there and you're floating, and it's a whole new environment. It's something that you have never experienced before. It is really uh, almost indescribable. But I think even beyond that, the first time that you go outside and and you know you're in your spacesuit and you climb through the hatch and you're out just you in the vacuum of space, I think that's an equally overwhelming uh, experience. And I remember distinctly remember just being overwhelmed with the beauty that I was seeing. You know, just this absolutely tremendous sight, the earth, you know, seeing the Earth, seeing the, the International Space Station and thinking about, you know, that, you know, 15 nations work together to build this thing. And it's a shining example of uh, international collaboration. Um, and just being you know, overwhelmed by that. And, but I remember thinking to myself, yeah, it's, it's really beautiful, it's really wonderful, but it's not real. And so the first time I went out the door, um, part of me would not accept what I was seeing was real. Now, obviously, I knew it was real, 
but it re just something didn't seem right. It didn't seem like I, I couldn't put my finger on it. And, and what I've since thought about, and, and I think what, what was going through my mind is I had absolutely nothing in my experience base to compare it to. So, you know, three spacewalks later, you know, several years later, uh, going out on my last spacewalk, it, after being on orbit for four months before I did it, it, it felt like I was going in my backyard. And it definitely felt real and, uh, uh, and in a lot of respects was a lot more enjoyable because, um, you know, I, I, I was a little bit more comfortable in, in that environment. Yeah. Um Thinking ahead, I, I usually try not to envision experiences too much in detail ahead of time, uh, unless there is a reason, I mean, unless it's something that I really need to prepare, because you have to be prepared for safety, for example. Um, what I would like that first view to be, though, and uh, and we'll obviously see the Earth from the Soyuz. There are two small windows, but um, the the first time that I go actually to the cupola, and um, f for those who don't, who don't know, the cupola is this uh, small module on the space station that faces Earth, and it's it's basically one big window. So it really allows you um, an incredible view of, of Earth from from horizon to horizon, and. Um, and I, I hope that the first time that I get to do that, to, to go there and, and watch the Earth, I, I, I will try to make it, a, a, you know, not just a casual passing by, but a really like a moment that is uh, where I have some time set aside and I can enjoy it and maybe with the right music and, um, you know, making sure that I um, fully take in that experience and that is something that I take away that I remember for forever. It might not happen. I might just end up floating by while going to the restroom, for example, but um, that's how I would like it to be. <laughs> okay, a couple of, a couple of notes from Twitter. Uh, C.A. Volumey says I had perfect pronunciation of his name. Now, I don't remember if that's the way I pronounced it before, because I, I just might have messed it up by saying, by, 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 push, by trying push, it twice. <laughs> pushing my luck and trying it again. Um, so, Nick Astronomer. Hey, hi, Nick. He wants me. He wants me to tell you that we are hopefully, well, the space tweeps are hopefully going to try to get to Baikonur to see your launch. Oh, I am absolutely counting on that. I, mean, I would, I would totally miss you guys if you didn't come. So um, I'm counting on on you guys being there. You know, I was actually planning on wearing my space tweeps shirt today, but, uh -huh. it's, but it's in the laundry. Oh. So I couldn't do that today. So. All right. All right. Um, let's see. Should we, uh, this is from uh, Clarion and the V Lounge, at Clarion College Key. Um, should we invest in asteroid mining companies? So what do you think? Should we invest in asteroid mining companies? Who is we? <laughs> uh, I don't know. It just says we. Yeah, well, I'm not sure that as a, you know, Public money we should invest in. No, I, I, I think you meant you, oh, like you, you, you and me. You, I mean, oh God, no, I, I don't. Know. I'm just kidding. I, mean, <laughs> I, I know nothing about money. I know that I get my my you know salary wired once a month, and it kind of stays there in the bank. I know nothing about investment. I don't manage my money. I probably just lose money out of inflation every day. I have no idea. So don't come to me for investment advice. <laughs> but you know, I, I think at some point. Um, Humanity is going to have to make use of the resources that we have in space. Oh, yeah. it, 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 it's a, it's a, there's a point in the finite future where it, you know our very survival is going to depend on on how much we've used, made use of the resources that are, are abundant and readily available in space. And that, and that is going to be the answer to that is going to be determined on how much we've progressed in our space program and can we make use of that. So right now, um, you know, it would be very difficult on a commercial scale to make use of the resources that are that are in an asteroid, for instance. I think um, it's not too far off in the future, though, when we will be able to do that. So, and I think it's a, it's a very um, important thing that, that we do. Yeah. So. And uh, again, I mean, I'm, I'm really not qualified to say what, you know, if it's wise from a financial point of view to invest in a, in a, in a company or another, but I'm personally really, really excited about uh, um, this new developments like uh, you know commercial space flight and uh, private companies uh, coming up with uh, business models to actually um, exploit um, space and resources in space because in, in the end as you were saying 
the point of doing all this is that we become at some point a space fear and civilization and in a way we already are but what I mean by space fair and civilization is like that people can go to space if they want to and if they want to work in space they can and uh, you know we are expanding uh, the, the physical boundaries of our, mm -hmm. of our civilization so um, I'm you know I'm, I'm really excited about all this um, initiatives that come from the private sector. Mm -hmm. So you know I'd like to touch back on a question that was asked before mm -hmm. and, and you know the, the question was you know how do you feel uh, being a woman in what had been a long time ago, maybe a traditionally you know, male dominated area. Right. But the same question can be asked about being a fighter pilot in the Italian Air Force, right? I mean, because that for you know many years was, was a male only type of profession as well, right? Yeah, uh, probably a little bit more than, than coming to the astronaut community in a way. Uh, I, I was the I belong to the second um, Air Force Academy class that had females, and so obviously I was one of the first, um, you know, women that got to a, a, a fighter squadron. Um, although, you know, it, it might look strange from the outside, but that was not an issue at all either. Um, you know, when you when you get to a fighter squadron and you you know it better than I do, you, you've come from years of training and you, you've gone through all that training like everybody else. And you share so many experiences with everybody, you know, even the, the people who are, you know, senior than you. They all went to the academy, they all went through, through pilot training, they all went to um, fighter leading training, they all went to their course. So you share with everybody the same, not only professional and training experiences, but in the end also the same human experiences. And, uh, you know, in the end, it's way more what you share with people than what you what separates you. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in the end, it doesn't really matter are you a boy or girl. Mm -hmm. You know, there's so much that you have in common with those people, and there is so much um, that has been invested in your training. So if you are there, you went through the same training as everybody else. Mm -hmm. So you just share too much for it to be a big, a big deal. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay, let's see if we have some more questions. Um, Lots of comments. Okay, this this comes from somebody named Isa, at oh, Isa. I think I know those people. Yeah, you, ever hear, you, ever hear, you ever hear of those guys? Uh, what surprised you the most about training so far? Oh, what surprised? And remember, me this the this most? is uh, this could be your boss speaking. So. <laughs> Isa is the European Space Agency, and it's you can see it behind us. Uh, the, Symbol behind us. All oh, right. What surprised me the most? Huh. I mean, one thing that uh, you know, in a way, catches you off guard. I'm not. I'm not saying that it really surprised me because people had warned me. But I guess being in the suit, in a mm -hmm. spacewalk suit, the first time, uh, even with all the warnings I'd had, you know, it's so hard, and it, you know, it's gonna take time to adjust, and it's overwhelming. The and it's right behind. And it's right behind. Yeah. That's where it is. Um, you know, it, even sort of knowing what to expect, it did catch me off guard. How difficult it is to adapt to that environment. Um, no, not actually the environment, but the suit itself. Mm -hmm. I mean, and a little bit it's because I'm really small and the suit is big. <laughs> so um, it might be a little bit harder for me being a small person to um, find ways of coping with that. Um, it's like, in a way, being a child again and you have to relearn how to move. Mm -hmm. um, even how to perceive your environment because your vision is so constrained, you cannot just turn your head, you're gonna have to turn your whole body and that takes energy and work. Mm -hmm. um, so your whole interaction with the environment around you, you have to relearn it and, and it's hard. I mean, it's mm -hmm. physically tough, it's, it's, it's all new. So um, again, it's not that I didn't expect it to be difficult, but you know, it, 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 some things caught me off guard, but I mean, and, and, and then it's become, you know, one of the most rewarding, actually, probably the most rewarding training I've done so yeah. far, just because it was so challenging, and, and it still is very challenging, and I still have so much to learn, but, um, you know, being able to progress a little bit and be able to adapt to that, to the suit, and make it sort of work for me, it's been very, very rewarding. I think no matter how well the suit fits you, mm -hmm. I mean, it's obviously worse if it doesn't, it doesn't fit well, but even if it fits perfectly, it, it takes hundreds of hours to feel comfortable in a suit. I mean, um, and it's and like I said, it's, it is really really hard work because you're basically inside a rigid balloon. 
And so every time you move your hand, and if you're out on a spacewalk or in the, in the pool, every time you grab something, it, you know those, those exercise things that you yeah. squeeze? It's like you're squeezing one of those. And so, um, you know, it really is a, a lot of work. And, and um, But the more you do it, the more it, it becomes comfortable and, and kind of feels like a, like a second skin. So question for Sam. Regarding the Orion capsule, are you optimistic and excited about the prospect of you going to the moon? <laughs> Well, <laughs> I mean, you know, if they told me you go, you know, you, you go on Orion to the moon, of course, I would be incredibly excited, um, you know, and I'm optimistic in the sense that I'm an optimistic person, so I like to, uh, to think that all opportunities are out there um, at some point. Uh, of course, it's a little bit early to, to speculate on something like this, um, but I'm, I'm really excited about this uh, cooperation um, on Orion between uh, NASA and ESA. Mm -hmm. It's been you know, like the big news of this last uh, week. Um, well, tell us about it. Maybe, maybe everybody hasn't heard about yeah, um, uh, Basically, it's been announced that uh, ESA will uh, provide the um, service module for the um, first Orion mission, which is slated for 2017 timeframe. Uh, and so it brings this whole um, international cooperation that we've uh, uh, had so successfully had on the International Space Station and we continue to have, it brings it to the next step, right. which is exploration and going beyond low Earth orbit. So I'm, I'm, I'm really very excited that we're um, you know, not, not wasting on this uh, capital that we have in, in knowing how to work together and share the burden of technological development uh, and then the excitement of actually performing the missions. Uh, we're not wasting that, we're continuing it. Um, and um, you know, I think that's the way that we're going to ensure that space exploration continues to go, to go on. Mm -hmm. that, that is an exciting prospect down the road. Um, okay, so greetings from Switzerland, from uh, at this informat. Oh, it's Paolo, Paolo Tivissimo. Hey, Paolo. Oh. Wait, you can't ask us questions on Twitter. No, that's another Paolo. Oh, that's a different Paolo? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Paolo, do you have any questions? This the, the Hangout, uh, Paolo? I, I'd like to know whether it's easier to see the stars in the night side of the Earth when doing a spacewalk. It, it is. I, I actually had a, uh, a time where I was on the end of the space station's robotic arm, and I was... Um, swept to the top of the space station. So I was about 30 meters above the space station and it was night. Uh, and although I was holding this big giant piece of the space station, I, I reached up and I turned my lights off on my helmet because I was far enough away from the lights of the space station. Uh, I was just basically out in space. Um, and the, the, you know, you really see the, the Milky Way come alive. Um, the best place though to watch the stars is in the cupola. Uh, and if you turn off all the light, and the cupola, um, you know, it's this windowed observatory on the bottom of the space station, but you could also, you don't, you don't just look at the Earth, you can see out into the, into the Milky Way as well. And if you turn off all the lights and you get really, um, you know, you, you tape over all the, the stray lights on maybe computers and everything else, and it gets really, really dark in there, uh, and then you let your eyes adjust, the Milky Way just comes alive. And it's the, the best view of the stars you've ever seen. And what's really neat about it, uh, is they rotate. So if it, you're not just looking at stars sitting there, you're looking at stars moving. And if you've ever been in a planetarium and you see this, the, the stars kind of rotating, that's what it's like because of our velocity around the planet makes them look like they're rotating. It's really absolutely breathtaking. Um, so let me go back to the other Paula question. Uh, comments on, and this is disinformatico. Matico. Disinformatico. Uh, and uh, what's the comments on the Bigelow inflatable module? Oh, that, that's really exciting. I mean, the only bad thing about it is that I'll be gone. <laughs> or, you know, <laughs> I won't see it in space, but um, I, would, I, I would have loved to see that in, uh, in space. And, I, um, and the reason I think it's really so exciting is that it's trying something completely new. It's, you know, it's, I, I know that Bigelow had some demonst you know, mm -hmm. technology demonstrators on orbit for a while, but uh, you know, really having people live in there and use it as a habitable mm -hmm. module, uh, that's going to be a first. And, uh, you know, if that works well, and there's no reason to think it will not, um, it, you know, it's going to be a, a new type of technology, a really promising new type of technology that we would have, uh, you know, proven and established for exploration. So it's very exciting. Cool. Yeah. cool. Dave maybe has some questions. Dave, you have um, a question? 
I know that sometimes you need to boost the station away from incoming debris. Um, do you have to, are there any plans to have any, let's say, refueling if those boosters eventually run out of fuel? Do they have to send up, would they have to send up extra fuel for you guys to do it, or how would that work out? Well, actually, the station is refueled on a regular basis. Uh, the um, Russian Progress and the ATV both can refuel the station. But the maneuvers you're uh, talking about, um, most of the time, the program tries to uh, schedule them, and, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but I think most of the time the program tries to schedule them so that they're done not with the um, uh, propulsion of the station itself, but using a visiting vehicle. For example, ATV, uh, the European uh, Automated Transfer Vehicle, which is docked to the Russian service module um, every time it launches for about six months. So there's one a year, uh, and so for about half of the year we will have an ATV docked to station. And when ATV is there, we will do those maneuvers. We'll try to, we might try to do those maneuvers with uh, ATV. Mm -hmm. And for sure, the schedule will boost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, plus there's also um, research right now into electric propulsion. So, you know, instead of doing this big thrust to, to boost the station back up uh, to, to the altitude that we want to be at, we have a very, very small thrust that basically counters act, counteracts the drag. So you basically main, can maintain the orbit. So that's one of the things that we're looking at, at doing. So, so you try to speak a little bit more than we speak in Russian. We speak in Russian, I don't know. Maybe. Right, never mind. <laughs> so, okay, well, I'll tell you what, we're going to take one last question. Uh, and again, it's from Nick, the Nick Astronomer, and thoughts on space tourists. Um, Exact. What are what are your thoughts on space tourism? Do you think they will be prepared enough, to, given the years of training that you do? Uh, so we're talking about space tourists on the space station, then I guess. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I think it's a you know uh, it's a good thing for the program, especially when uh, space tourists can. Uh, attract attention to the program and make people aware of it and maybe find um, different ways of communicating about the program that we as professional astronauts wouldn't be comfortable doing or wouldn't be able to do. I mean, most of us are, you know, come either from an operational background or from a technical background. Um, and space tourists sometimes are artists or singers. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, the next one is scheduled to fly as a singer. Um, so they have other ways of connecting to people, of communicating, of, of, of reaching out to the public. So I think that's a, that's an exciting thing. As far as preparation is concerned, um, obviously those people have a very limited amount of training. Uh, they're expected to be able to function uh, on board, to be able you know, to take care of themselves, to eat, to use the restroom. Uh, but they're obviously not trained to take care of the station. Mm -hmm. So um, that's the difference in the amount of training. I mean, we are trained to be able to take care of the station and to perform the science program on, on board. The space tourists are trained to take care of themselves on board, mm -hmm. so that's why the limited amount of training, which is not, you know, so little. I think they still go through several months of training, oh, even I mean, just with that. So a year. But, yeah, so j just to piggyback on that, I, I think the more people that get to go to space and see our Earth from, from space, the better off the world is going to be. And as far as the level of training goes, there's a big difference in training between flying a suborbital flight uh, oh, yeah. and, 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 a, and an orbital flight. And even in the suborbital suborbital flight, which is you know 15 minutes long or for the for the part that you're in space or, or, or on that order of magnitude, there's going to be training on, on on that. But like you said, the, the people who come to the space station, you know, go through significant training, uh, and I think it's a, it's important. So. So I think uh, I think we're coming to the close of your first Google Plus Hangout. All right. What'd you think? Oh, it was awesome. So um, thank you, everybody. Cool. What'd you guys think? <laughs> Very <laughs> fun. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to close out. This is going to be uh, this is being recorded. It's going to be on YouTube. Okay. Uh, we'll send some links out and uh, and send us your feedback. I mean, I, yeah. I, we'd like to do it more. So um, tell us what? how we can make it better. Absolutely. All right. So I did it for this one. So. Okay, we're going to stop the broadcast and we're going to exit out. So, ciao. Okay.